we have uh, we have a panel here. Um, Carol Watts on my my far left, um, who's uh, written uh, um, two things for the Dartwood. Um, there's a, a sequence of poems, um, which which has kind of been stitched together into into one part for the uh, for the Kindle, which is a very very long sequence when blue light falls. Um, Becky Kremen, uh, who's um, worked with Ryan on one. Um, to uh, to do a piece called River Writing, which they'll they'll do a little chunk of later on this evening. Um, Becky's work is very much centred around performance and the performative. Um, I should have said Carol has um, written a, a, an essay about Richard Long's work, um, which I think is a, a an interesting piece in the in the anthology because it's about um, it's it's an exegesis really of Long's work. Uh, it's it's. Um, Quite an unusual uh, appraisal, I think, for his stuff. And um, Liz Collini, um, to my left here, so Liz is um, a text artist I first came across uh, in the text festival in um, in Barry, uh, which is directed by Tony Tree here, but which I've been involved in from the from the very beginning. Uh, and some of Liz's work is um, is out on a table around the corner there, which you can have a look at um, uh, after after we've after we finished this evening. And um, that is our lovely panel. The idea of this um, uh, of this discussion is that it, you would be very, very welcome to throw in some questions. I'm going to start the ball rolling with a few uh, a few things, but we very much invite uh, you to participate. And um, <clears throat> as I said, I've been shut away for a couple of years, so it's very strange to be out in the world again. You know, it's uh, it's really curious. I don't, I almost don't feel that I'm quite here. And um, <laughs> Forgive my kind of rustiness, you know, I really have been talking to cats for, for too long. Um, so uh, the, the first thing that I've, um, uh, that I've got written down on this, this piece of uh, useful paper, uh, which I'd like to ask Carol first of all, is um, who are your antecedents God. and how are you different? <laughs> um, God, where would you start? Blimey, I know. Um, I, I... I don't know. Um, I think, well, I, do, I, I guess I'm going to come at it a different kind of a way um, and talk about the dark wood in relation to my antecedents and where I've come from because um, I came to thinking about writing poetry quite young, but I really got on with it when I turned 40. So I'm relating to the dark wood um, both as a kind of idea, which I haven't seen yet, by the way. I've, I haven't seen the anthology, so I, in a sense I'm imagining the dark wood and, and kind of projecting people into it without knowing if they're there or not. But the, the dark wood is that Dantean moment, you know, of going in the journey and halfway through your life and so on, which is what Phil was talking about earlier. Um, but it's also that poem in Olsen about cold thickets. Um, and it's also the wood as in W-O-U-L-D, which has this what you would what would you do? It's, it's got this subjunctive dimension to it, which is what I'm excited about with this anthology, because what would you do if you had the chance to pull together the kind of work that you've been doing, and what takes place when you, you step into the dark wood? And I guess that's how I'm going to relate to your question, because I stepped into the dark wood when I turned 40 and decided I was going to start writing poetry, and I did it blind. That is, all the, the kinds of um, possible antecedents I might have were not there. I didn't know why I was there. Um, I know my training, which is academic, and I knew who I liked, which would have been people early on like Alice Notley and others. Um, but I didn't know what I was doing, and that was the whole point, because I discovered that the way I was going to find out where I was in the dark wood was to try out other forms of making. I wasn't trained as an artist, didn't go to art college, didn't know if I could draw, um, wasn't sure what text work was, didn't know where my poetry was going to sit, any of that. But I started to work in multiple forms. I started to draw, actually, is what I did. I went down to a beach, I picked up objects, I drew the objects, um, I started to collage all of the words in the Financial Times about China and collected it alphabetically and stuck them onto pieces of card. That's how I started. So I've written lyrical poetry, I guess, but it's come through a 
process of moving between. And I still don't know where I am with that process, but what I'm excited about with the anthology is it sort of raises that question about mm. when you're in this space, how do you walk? How do you walk through it? I could tell you antecedents, but I've discovered them afterwards, mm. I guess. Is the, is the mm. yeah. Liz, how, how would you? Um, I slightly um, parallel experiences. I, I had a previous life as a manager in the NHS and I got to a certain age and I was faced with my, I think it was my eighth reorganisation and I knew I couldn't stand up in front of another group of people with an overhead projector as it was then and a flip chart and say forget everything I told you, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we're going to go this way now. And so I kind of jumped off a, a cliff and went to art school because I'd been going to an evening class and drawing apples and pears on a tea towel and, you know, getting quite good at drawing apples and pears on a tea towel. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, one thing led to another and I, I, I went to art, art college and things which had been quite, I suppose, suppressed in my work um, started to come out, not surprisingly, in the way of the art that I started to make. And, I mean, I, I didn't realise at the time, I again realised with hindsight, that all those years as a manager, and someone who wrote a lot of planning documents and strategy documents and reports and that sort of thing, you're speaking with somebody else's voice, you're not speaking with your own voice. And I started to look at language in the public arena, just things like signage and um, plaques and memorial stuff and things that you take for granted. Manhole covers, I was obsessed with manhole covers for a time because of their kind of rich metaphorical significance. I mean there are things which say, um, oh, is it the Stanton Warrior? There's the airtight inspection cover, there's the self-locking cover. My favourite is the rapid slide-out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I sort of start, all these things started coming, you know, at me from an angle I hadn't been expecting. And then, I suppose, you're talking about anti antecedents, uh, I came across the work of Ian, ha Ian Hamilton Finlay. And I picked up a book, which was a collection by Eva Brew of in Hamilton Finley work, and Phil and I were talking about this earlier, I had that reaction where you think, oh bloody hell, you know, this guy has done everything I ever would have wanted to do. Um, and that kind of love-hate thing you get where you recognise something. And I think at that point, I felt I was given almost permission to be the kind of artist I wanted to be, and then, you know, went off and did all sorts of things with casting and and eventually came to this process of drawing text. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to see some of the work that's outside, but I, I draw words, essentially, and they look a bit like plans or blueprints. Mm. So that's some of where I've come from. Mm. I'm, I'm back here. Um, I am not 40, so didn't have that realisation at 40. Um, but maybe I will and change everything. Um, the interesting thing about the permission to make work, and I think that for me came when um, I started a, doing an MA at Royal Holloway called Poetic Practice, um, where all of a sudden everything that I thought wasn't allowed to fit together was allowed to you know, that did, did exist and there was a space for work that was poetic and was performative and was digital or, you know, was kind of thinking about the process of writing and, and not necessarily what it was to, um, I guess, consider necessarily what the end object will be, but kind of think more about the process of doing that action. And for me, that um, is... is what's important in my own practice is to think about what you know what I am investigating how how am I investigating it and the kind of not that the outcome isn't important because the outcome obviously is important but the kind of considerations of process um which became really interesting to me um and then kind of being exposed to loads of you know, poets and artists that I had never been exposed to and just suddenly was 
you know, overwhelmed with this catalogue of things that existed and that were real. And that was, I think, that sense of having permission to explore um, with language was something that kind of became really important and still is really important in my practice. So that kind of idea of how you can explore with language is something that is interesting to me and the people that do that are interesting to me. Mm. When we first met, you were talking about um, Marina Abramovich, I think, you went to see a show of hers, and she's sort of become this very totemic figure, and this, I don't know, this, I think it's a musical, or, you know, there's very, there's stage shows, and, you know, uh, we went to see uh, uh, a, a thing which was about the life of Mar yeah. Marina Abramovich as a film, there's, there's this kind of enormous outpouring of stuff in it, and the work seems really quite difficult work, and yet it's, it's, touched um, people enormously mm. and well, I wonder what your relationship is to to that kind of that area the the area of live art and those those people um, I think for me with live art it's the the interest in um, duration and performance and how I guess for live art there's um, a, such a growing space um, for that currently and for me, the interest is kind of taking elements which exist in live art and they become fused with my kind of poetic practice and not being kind of afraid to make language behave in new ways or behave in different ways. And for me, a lot of the time, that process of um, writing a poem or constructing a text comes through these instances of performance. So. Um, they might be private durational performances that then could actually physically make text. Um, and then the interesting thing comes again when you attempt to re-realize that text in a performance and how, um, I guess, you can make it work again um, is interesting to me and kind of rebuild it or reconstruct it as something else and has something new. And I think with, um, I guess, live art, the interest is because you know, every time something is performed, it is it's a it's a newness. Whereas in print, once it's printed, it's it's there and it's kind of this more stable thing. So the kind of un I guess in performance, the ability to unstabilize it again is interesting to me. Carol, mm. mm. um, uh, we we were talking uh, the other day about uh, your piece. Uh, on Richard Long, which mm -hmm. is which is I think taken, I don't know, it's been about six months or something like that. It feels like quite a journey as I've been pulling together the book. We've we've I sort don't of touched. Want to know the <laughs> but it's no, I, I, okay. But but it's um, it's yeah. it's felt as if you've kind of you've actually got lost within that yeah. that piece at the same time that I was getting lost in the middle of all of the stuff that I was doing and and, and attempting to pull together and make sense of. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, because this is um, a completely different terrain than the terrain that you normally would write about, I, I, I would think. It, it is, although I've realised that I've got more in, in common with it than I thought. Um, the Richard Long pieces, which are in the um, paper anthology, right, are, are these um, round concrete poems, which are circular, circular. One of them's uh, one hour in Dartmoor, and the other one is Human Nature Walk. And uh, he produced them um, from walks, because a lot of his work is connected to walking, and walking is the practice that he uses. It's, it's a sort of sculptural practice, I guess, for him. And it's obviously, in some ways, out in the world. It's outside the world of the gallery, and the walking he does um, sometimes over 55 miles or over several days, and the text works which are produced out of that are um, clearly in some sense documentary. I mean, they, they register the words which come out of the process of a walk. So, for example, the one on Dartmoor, is, it's uh, one hour in Dartmoor and there are 60 words, so you're kind of encouraged to think that there's some kind of pedometry going on in this round circle of words which clearly are registering his walking proprioceptively through an environment. Um, but the thing about the encounter with Richard Long is kind of interesting to me in that part of me really wanted to resist them. Um, 
and I wasn't too sure at the beginning. There were multiple reasons why it was. I've ended up with talking about what I'm calling a kind of counter-walking of Mark. Yeah. So that I'm interested in, for him, the text works are somehow secondary. The primary sensual experience is with the sculpture out in the landscape, or a, scul a sculpture in a gallery. And the text works are somehow works for the imagination in his eyes, in a sort of in a strangely unconceptualized way. And they're enormous quite often. They'll be the wall of a gallery, or, or they'll be have another life in a you know in a book or um, online and so on. So they have multiple spaces that they exist in. But for him, they're secondary, really. They're they're kind of after notations in some sense, which presumably he just puts together by sketching down the words that come to him procedurally on the walk. Um, the thing that I found problematic about it, I suppose, was that I felt um, there's a very strong charge in them, which he still, this is a life's work, clearly it's going on still, um, in relation to walking outside of galleries. And in the late 60s, 70s, that was a really important move, you know, not to be inside the space of the gallery, yeah. the, the space of, you know, Smithson calls it non-site, out in the world. But I guess the question I wanted to ask of them doing, thinking about them for this anthology and writing on them, was what it would mean to come to Long now in 2013. What does it mean, what does that gesture in the Long mean from here? And I was particularly thinking of it tonight as I was listening to Tim. Because if you listen to Tim's words and the spaces that they occupy, you know, airport spaces, you know, kinds of organ life, you know, forms of, you know, different forms of culture, um, the fact that you couldn't really tell whether they at times were, you know, what kind of species thought it was almost. Um, I want to, I guess I want to bring that world to the long. Um, you know, what is the long a gesture in relation to? Uh, that was a big question for me, and I didn't want to just recapitulate some kind of romantic sense of this, you know, nature, you know, land art, which is what it's clearly got in, in its history. Yeah, yeah. But what does it mean to think about now and when? in something like the dark wood, say, but also in terms of everybody's different kinds of practice. There are multiple sites for the work, and there's flows between these sites. And so what does it mean to have multiple versions of the same gesture? Um, if you look at work on Long, it always talks about the gesture beginning some site outside and then being completed by the other works internal to the gallery. Yeah. That that's a completion. For me, it really is, in some sense, something else. It's, especially given the kind of work that Becky's talking about. I mean, the, the, the way that things are moving now, it seems to me more like a kind of archival disassembly than a completion. Mm. So it became very exciting to me at that point to start thinking about Lang's work in those terms. Because then you don't have a simple opposition between a placed location out in the world, natural site. He has these extraordinary images you know, of what seem like wildernesses with single footprints or lines drawn in the dust as if there are no human beings in the site at all, as if there's a fantasy of sort of primary mark making, that there's never been anywhere else, anybody else in that frame except him, and he's taking a photograph of it to record the fact that he did. You know, that, that, that fantasy. And I guess I'm questioning that fantasy now on a planet like ours. So I guess what I've discovered in the long, which I wasn't expecting to find, is that when he walks, even if he walks in straight lines, he's actually walking in curved space. There's, there's something else going on in terms of thinking about planetary walking, other kinds of flow. I'm not sure if his work is even necessarily about that, but that's certainly what it put into play for me. So it made me think about, for example, kinds of site-specific work that many people here are probably engaged in for themselves. Site-specific work which then has multiple kinds of walking that it then goes on to do, and the relative relationship of those different forms. And I do that kind of work myself. You know, I work on a sheep farm, um, which I map, I have mapped by walking, and I try to walk it as if I'm walking in non-Euclidean space. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I guess that's what I found in the long. So it's been a, I'm doing counter walking, mm -hmm. counter walking mm -hmm. with long, because I'm listening to Tim. And I want, to, I, know, I want to know what relationship that material has to the space that Tim opens up, non-spaces. Part of the idea of that essay was to um, to draw a comparison between Richard Long and Sukowski, who also had a, a life work in A, mm -hmm. and to kind of put those two people side by side. 
I don't know if that was was that something that, um, that well, you I, took and left or I and did left take behind. and leave it partly. Yeah. Um, what because there are these word objects in in law, um, and he's interested in the relationship of words to uh, labour and forms of industrial practice and all sorts of things. Those words pop up in the long, they're there and he experiences them as he walks by. And in a sense the Zukowski material is, is, has something in common in that we're talking about word objects which also can be made to move. You know, so like the, the, the horse in, in A, which he makes move, it starts to produce movement through this, this object which becomes a, a, a gesture if you like. And that there's a politics in that and a history and a form of labour which is kind of in there in the object in the way that it's made to move. I'm not sure whether I find that kind of practice going on in, in law. What I did find though, for myself anyway, which I also found in, in Zukowski, was, um, was the sense of what happens, and in Zukowski it's a bit thought about in terms of music, yeah. you know, when you've got a, a, the, the composition that comes through the tangibility of materials. What is the point, he asks, I think, in one of his pieces, what is the point at which that tangibility, which is internal to the process of composition, becomes apprehendable? That, that moment where it becomes some, an object to apprehend and tangible in the world, that is, that materiality. And for him, that's what music does. Mm. And I think that's something like what goes on in some of the practice in, in Long. That there's a, there's, there are scores to be found in Long, but you have to read counter Long. Sometimes to get them. That's what I think. Thank you. Yes. That's, 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 that's what it should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I had yeah. to walk it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa, I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your relation to the, the physical in, in your work. And you've, you've written a piece for the, the anthology called Absence. Yeah, yeah. And I wondered if you could just mm. lead us through that a, a little way. Well, again, it's quite, I suppose, sequential about the way that I've come to work. And, and I, I never like being asked why, um, but sometimes that is you know, a relevant thing to think about. Um, I was very struck um, when I was studying at, at, um, as part of my MA with the idea of the word as a marker of absence, that it's a mark, it's, a, it's a signifier of an absence signified, and I was, I was very taken with this idea and the idea of you know, deferral um, in space and time of the thing. You can't get at the thing, the word is there, but it's not the thing. And I've been working with text. I mean, I'm a bit of a magpie, I tend to trip over things and you know, grab things from all over the place mm -hmm. to work with. And I was working. Um, with, with text in the printmaking department at the Royal College. And obviously we've got fantastic digital facilities there which you could link up with all sorts of other ways of producing work. But every time I printed something out from the computer to use it as a stencil or whatever to make work with, it didn't feel right. And this wasn't from a Luddite, not, you know, I don't like it because it's digital. It wasn't about that, it was about something else. And I realised in the end that it was something to do with the kind of blockiness of, of, of the word printed out in that way. It just didn't, it didn't have whatever that thing is. And I thought, well, I'll start drawing my own text. Um, and through that process, it kind of reconnected with some sort of materiality of writing. I mean it's quite basic, it's quite literal really, what you know, what where I've come from, where I've got to and what I do is a sort of mystique about it. Um, it was in some sense a reconnection with the fact that language is something which we make. It hasn't come down from on high. Um, and that we make it in many, many ways. I mean we make it by speaking it and we make it by writing it and we make it by printing it. And I suppose it, it was a material reappropriation of the virtual in the end, because what I would, what I still do, is print out lettering and then redraw it. So it's taking it back, if you like, from the virtual. So that sense of materiality is really, really central to the way that I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that, that as a as a poet, um, uh, you know, it's, it's so easy to ignore. 
that, that those basic physical facts, and um, I, I actually try to move off the page when I can because it may, it forces me to rethink. Well, how is this thing made? You know, what is it that I'm that I'm doing? You know, there's a tendency, I think, to produce work that goes into polite little volumes and uh, and is folded, you know, with its 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 face to itself, mm. and and it in, in a way it's disappeared. And I, I think that there's this enormous space that that your work opens out, um, which is um, completely counter to that, using, using Carol's word. I don't know, if, do you, would you care to...? Ooh, um, well, it's an interesting one, isn't it, about space and place, and how those things are brought into play in the way that work is made. Um, and there's a sense of, you know, where is it located, I suppose, for me, because it's a very material practice, that the, the positioning and the space that something occupies is important. But then that starts to come into tension with virtual space and what we're all working with now in, you know, the digital arena. Um, I mean, yeah, working off the page is great, and um, <coughs> give me a room and I'll fill it, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I'm quite getting to your point here, Phil. Give me another steer well, on that. Okay, yeah. I think that um, one, one of the things that, um, that strikes me about your work is that um, you are very, very careful about how you situate the text that you, um, that you work with uh, in a particular place. So it has great particularity. So part of the piece is about the, um, the, uh, the environment that, that you put it in, you know, that it's, it's, so you're not um, working in a neutral space, you're working in something that's that's really quite charged, and you take some time to um, uh, to find the right uh, the right context for the language that you use. Yeah, I suppose it, you know it depends in a sense, you know where the, the primary reason for making that piece of work, so that is stating the obvious, but. Um, um, I don't know, I'm not sure I can answer that actually. I mean, there's a sense that I like the work to float. I think that's probably the best way I can answer your question. That I like it to be, although it has to be situated on a surface, I like it to float on that surface. So there's no, there's no like guiding grid. Um, that if it's on a wall, then it's surrounded by air, if you like. So that there is space for meaning to flow in and around mm. the letters and the words. I wonder if you could just talk about one of the, there are, uh, okay, so um, there are um, particular sites that you've used, so for instance you've used uh, abandoned buildings. Well there's the, the, old, the Shoreditch Town Hall basement, which I don't have many of you been into the Shoreditch Town Hall's basement. Oh it's wonderful. Um, it's a really, really spooky place, um, and in fact, part of it was used as a dungeon apparently at one time. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I did two versions of the word softly there that were on opposing walls. They were they were kind of quite. Um, so that just hung in the space there, um, but of course, when it had to be erased, it was chalk. There's this little residue that's still there. Even the indentations are still there. And that was just very much in response to the building, softly, softly, it had this slightly creepy Jack the Ripper feeling to it. Um, so yeah, you know, the, the, the installations um, I really love doing because of the fact that they're so ephemeral and they will be gone. Um, so they get even more absent than the absent word to start with. Thank you. I'm I wanted to ask, actually both, both you and uh, Ryan have written a piece together for the, the Dark Widow. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, about that. And um, Ryan, if you want to chip in, or if you okay. might be, hello. <laughs> if you can project uh, enormously, that would be, that would be good. Okay. How, how, did, how did you arrive at that? That was, it was, um, it was a surprising thing. It you? was, uh, Ryan had actually been doing um, a lot of walking um, around the city and 
um, had been doing things where he'd been going and writing by the river, and um, then we thought about um, kind of the the river and the Thames going on, um, and about what that meant, and it became this process of thinking through, I guess, not not communicating with the river or in any way kind of we didn't, it became this kind of thing of not wanting to describe the river or not wanting um, to be the river or anything like that. So the process um, became this thing where we both wrote. Um, a lot of text went on kind of these mini little um, I guess walks along the river and we sent text to each other. Um, and then from that we kind of made these phrases um, which were a list of 10 phrases that we were only allowed to use those 10 phrases when we came to actually constructing um, the main text. Um, and it became about us communicating with each other across the river. So we found um, a point on each side of the river which we would inhabit for a certain amount of time um, and had a process of writing to each other without being able to communicate with each other and um, the only way that we would know when to stop writing was to hold up um, a white flag to each other. So it became this kind of idea of signaling. We a, bridge, a bridge. A bridge, yeah. We were a bridge. We became a bridge. Um, so it was this idea of thinking about how, I guess, language can bridge things, but it, that's impossible because it's, you know, not going to happen. Um, but also this idea of communication and what it is to communicate through writing without, I guess, knowing what the other person is writing or having these kind of set um, ten lines became this kind of language um, for the piece, which m meant that it was really restricted and it wasn't necessarily, a, it definitely didn't become about kind of describing the river or but just kind of being, being there and being there physically um, is, is something that's always important in our work. And um, yeah, I don't know, is that, is that a good description? <laughs> Is that okay? Um, Do you, you approve? I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the yeah the interaction with sight um, is something that's really important, and that when you were talking about that idea of the counter kind of that sense of not kind of being in something and doing something, and it being very much the present. So the kind of for us the action of live writing in the present is always really important, but then also that then kind of becoming this counter rhythm to the actual space that you're inhabiting or what or what that is telling you about my experience of being in that space um, or telling Ryan what the experience of being on the South Bank is at that exact time. Um, yeah. And we also realised that we could see the whole of the river pass by us if we sat there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we're going to, we'll hear um, a, a little portion of that um, in, a, in a few moments. But I would like to open this out, actually, and, um, and ask if anybody has any questions for uh, our illustrious, illustrious uh, panelists here, and or myself. And uh, it'd be very nice to have any of your thoughts. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I've got a question no, sure, primarily yeah. for you, Phil, given that you've been looking at so much stuff mm. over the last couple of years. Indeed. Um, it, it, it's a silly question, but a generalisation in a way. But is there a difference between a visual artist, primarily, who is using words, and a poet who is trying to you know, project words in, in a visual space? It's, yeah, it's, no, I'm it's, thinking it's, of Lawrence Wiener, for example, who, yeah. who, whose words are dreadful, as far as I'm concerned, um, and look great, but do, do you know what I, I'm saying? It's kind of like, are the poets better users of words than the artists? I think it's a, it's, no, it's, it's a really interesting question, and um, 
uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's. Um, I think that there there are a couple of things that that have been very apparent. One of them is that um, almost as you would expect, um, the poets uh, obsessively um, dig into the language and um, linguistically, you know, they're 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 obviously entranced by the possibilities of what's being said and how you rearrange that and the nuances of it and. Um, <clears throat> Conversely, um, the artists you, they tend to use words as, as one of a set of equally important components. Now, that means it's both, um, it's both liberating and yet also um, it, it, it takes away some focus from the language. Okay, um, somebody like Lawrence Wiener, actually I, would, I, I think his, his language is quite fascinating. Um, uh, I don't always understand it, but I mean, it's, it's coming out of um, an interrogation of what language does, and the idea that language could be a sculpture, you know, that, that an idea can be a sculpture, and um, uh, I think there's quite an interest in Wittgenstein there, so there's, you know, so there's, there's, there's really quite a deep um, investigation of language, I, I think, in, in Lawrence's work. Um, so, but it is one of a part of a, of a battery of, of things. Now, um, I actually think that taking away some of the, <clears throat> may, thinking about visuality maybe as, um, almost as metaphor, you know, it's, 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 it's another component to be used and I think that because we're, we're all now um, starting to use computers a great deal when we communicate with each other uh, and we're surrounded, you know, with visuality, and we're surrounded with an extraordinary array of techniques of using the word, and many of them are visual. Uh, you know, I type a computer. I can uh, on a computer. I can um, I have an enormous number of fonts to choose from. I can choose to print out a piece of uh, writing. I can choose to email it. I can um, uh, drop pictures into it. You know, it's 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 what we have as as a series of set of tools is 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 becoming enormous, and um, we're using them almost. Um, Blindly, I think sometimes as, as poets, I certainly would say that of, of myself. You know, I have to sort of re-remind myself to, okay, you know, so what? What are we gonna? Uh, what are we gonna do with with, with this stuff? Uh, I think maybe taking away some of the focus from um, simply teasing through the language, and also thinking about somebody like Vino. Well, what is, what is his language practice? Or Jenny Holzer? You know, well, what is her language practice? Borrows, you know, 